Hello and welcome to Lost in Criterion. My name is Adam Glass, and my partner is... John Patrick Owitari Dorgan. He's hyphenated his last name because he's a liberal monster. Yes, right. I am what you... you, you uh, yeah, I'm in your yes. nightmares. This week we're going to be talking about Walkabout, the 1971 film directed by the British man Nicholas Rogue, set and filmed in Australia. Um... It's it's a weird one. Oh, it is a very weird one. tell you what i yeah i had i had a pretty bad week this week pat uh trying to watch this my power's been out and on and out and on and my internet i haven't had internet connection so i wasn't able to watch this on hulu for until until yesterday really um but not as bad as my father driving me into the desert shooting at me setting the car on fire and then shooting himself in the head um <laughs> Which, spoiler alert, no. happens in the first ten minutes of this movie. Right, so I assume everybody knows it's going to happen. Yeah. But man, yeah, man, that is, ugh, that is a weirdly upsetting scene. It's... But it's weird before that. Oh, like, yeah. I want to ask you, like, did you pick up on some really, like, that actor, the guy who played the dad, uh-huh. did a damn good job. Oh, yeah. For a man who's only in the film for like ten minutes. Yeah. He, that was a... Because, man, you get some creepy-ass vibes off of him right from the very yeah. beginning. Yeah. Oh, man, yeah. Um, and then, like, and all those jump cuts between his, his daughter's ass and the uh, and him, like, with this really weird contemplative look on his face. Yes. That, is, that is an unsettling yes. film. Oh, there's so much unsettling about this movie. And it's mostly, it mostly happens through jump cuts and weird. Uh, it's just weird. Um, we open... We open in this very, very weird... Well, first off, we open with an explanation of what a walkabout is. Um, the, the movie derives its title from the Aboriginal Australian uh, sort of uh, rite of passage where a 16-year-old male is sent out into the outback on his own to survive and to learn how to survive or to, to put into effect everything he has learned about how to survive. Uh, and uh, I suppose if he lives and comes back, he's good. And if he doesn't... Yeah, I mean, he succeeded. If he doesn't, <laughs> um, well, he's out of everybody's yeah, hair. Yeah, we don't need to worry about him anymore. Um, so there's... We establish that, and, and obviously the movie the movie plays with that as a coming-of-age tale uh, with with the daughter um, and the son being lost in, in the outback as well after their father tries to kill them and then kills himself. Um, but when we, we first, they're very, they're very, you know, modern folk. Um, well, for the time of the filming, well, yeah. obviously. The, the daughter, the daughter is very much an urban person. Teen. Teen. Um, not, not understanding hardship at all. Um, and, and to have this hardship forced upon her is, is her walkabout in the same way. Um, and there's there's a lot in this movie of this juxtaposition of of modern and and Aboriginal um, nature and and you know modernity um, that gets started right away right away we start out oh yeah yeah we we very much we start out with this you know, we've got these lost radio signals over dry mud, and then we immediately cut to Aboriginal music as we see scenes of modern Australian city life. And, you know, we, we you know, lots of cuts, a brick wall, we see the outback again, and there sounds of cars, we see a butcher, we see this park, but all the trees have labels on them. Um, so it's it's... It's just weird. It's a lot of juxtaposition right from the start, and a lot of jump cuts, and that is something that defines this movie. This—I I don't know if there's a shot that's more than three seconds long in the entire thing, 
Um, well, well, that's and, like, yeah. I mean, I mean that's I an mean, exaggeration, obviously. But like, sometimes it's very effective, and then other times, oh yeah, just but it's, just hard to watch. It's, it just depends on the situation. It's super. Like some, like I said, like they do. A, he did the director or the actor. It's hard to tell. Does a fantastic job of making the do, the dad as creepy and frightening oh, a yeah. human being as you can in about five minutes. Oh of film. yeah. Oh yeah. But, and that's, but I mean, then, that's like, even before the we know it's Sometimes the cuts are just like, why did, we sh- why did we see that? Yeah. Like, why is there a brick wall? Yeah. <laughs> like, exactly. There's like, a lot of... Whatever symbolism he's aiming for gets a little bit lost yeah. for me. But I think I think we, by the end of it, you know, if I'm understanding the movie correctly, and we'll get, we'll, obviously we'll get into more of this in the next hour. Um, if I'm understanding the movie correctly, I think that... As a whole, it works together. You just don't understand it at the beginning. And that's uh, one of the things that really uh, sets this movie apart. And um, I think you you compared it before we started talking to 2001 because of this. Well, it is um, it is 2001 A Space Odyssey in the desert. Yeah, essentially. The, the, these films are... The two films are so incredibly yeah, similar that... It's a very... If I, didn't, if I did not literally know better, yeah. it, I would say it was the same director. I mean, um, it has the same sort of... Yeah. As I think the Wikipedia page described it, hypnotic filmmaking. Like, yeah. it's... At times, the just droning of the sound and combined with the imagery just sort of yeah. you know, space out. And, and combined as it, well with the disjointed narrative. Um, yeah. So we're, we're following... We're principally following the main story of these kids lost in the desert, principally following the main story of you know, how taking over the ship... But then we, we, we do all these jumps to other things that are affecting what we're doing, but then sometimes not related. And then, you know, there's there's a lot of weird narrative in this. And we don't necessarily know if things are taking place in the order we're seeing them. Um, there's, there's not a lot of cause and effect through the movie where they don't necessarily have to be in chronological order. And when we when we jump to other scenes, we don't necessarily know that the same amount of time has passed. Yeah, we're we're yeah left really left in the dark about yeah, yeah like the like sequence of with events the, with and the dead. how they all fit together. Yeah, with the dead, for instance, on on the just kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. With the dead, we get um, we followed the kids for a couple of days. So he's he shot at them, and then he sets the car on fire, and he pours out the fuel, and then we hear a gunshot, and he falls. Uh, so it's suggesting that he shot himself, but we never see him again because, there, pointedly, um, the sister is trying to keep her little brother from from seeing what her dad <laughs> what their dad has done. Um, yeah. So they run off down the down the ditch. So like. As far as we're concerned, on their end, days later, we get this quick jump to just the father sitting up. Yeah, that's weird. Which is a but weird... he uses sh- that same imagery later with the buffalo standing back up. Yes, yes. I have to be, it's weird, but yeah, you, it almost points yeah. to some weird theme that I yeah. don't quite understand. But it's, it's, it's yeah, <laughs> and that's that's one theme I'm, I'm not even attempting to... I don't know what to to think about that. There's there's other things that the movie's trying to say that I think I can grasp. But um, but at the same time, it's almost as if the dad actually did, you know, survive that initial gunshot because in a, you know, a few more, like an hour later in the movie, we see some ab- an aboriginal tribe that has discovered the burnt out remains of the car. And not only is the dad's body no longer there, but there's a body hanging in a tree nearby um, that's very, very much mutilated. So I don't know if it's supposed to be the father. Um, yeah, yeah, we it, it's really confusing about it. Is that the father? Yeah. Because it it doesn't really necessarily look like him, and I don't know if that's just a an issue with like the filmmaking and trying to get a dummy that actually looks like yeah the character, or if it's deliberately not supposed yeah. to look like him. And, and somehow I think maybe it's deliberately not supposed to look like him because other aspects of the movie, uh, like the makeup done uh, as they're, as the kids are you know, dying of 
uh, uh, thirst, essentially. Uh, the makeup of their, you know, sunburnt, dry faces uh, is very good. I mean, it's very believable. Uh, and maybe they just decided to have the kids lay out in the sun for 12 hours, um, and it's not makeup at all. possible. But, uh, but yeah, this, this, this guy in the tree, um, but if it's not the dad, one, where's the dad, and two, why is this other guy there? Um, yeah, it gets really complicated about, like, yeah. what is this trying to say, then? Yeah, because, like, was it even the dad who drove them out there, or was it some just crazy person who drove them out there and tried to kill them? Or yeah. it's, it's really complicated if you think about it too much. Yeah, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's really disconcerting a lot. In, Let's just in say that, like, right from the beginning, that this film is really... I liked it, but very hard. It's yes, it to is, watch. It is a hard because movie. just because it, it is very both upsetting and confusing. Yeah, and and we've got we, the girl sets up the picnic, um, and this this whole domestic thing that that we see mirroring uh, mirroring her mother putting the picnic together um, before they left, and what happens to the mom? We never know that. Um, right. Well, she never called anybody to tell yeah. her that her husband and children are missing? Yeah. Why is why Because there obviously not been the mother sort of knows where call. they go because the dad yeah. was doing some sort of geological survey. Yeah. So it seems, but who knows? Um, it's just. So we've got the little boy, you know, playing at. playing at murder, shouting bang bang as he shoots his water pistol. And then. Yeah. And then his dad starts shooting back with an actual handgun. Um, and the kid just doesn't comprehend it at yeah, all. Yeah, the, the kid thinks they're still it. playing, and he he's really fun. And then and then the daughter tackles him, and they try to make their escape. Yeah, well, like it's really that part is probably not the part where the dad kills himself. That was weird, but like the part where the dad starts shooting is probably the most upsetting part of the film. Yeah, for me, one of the most. I mean, there's a couple other that were really bad, but like. Just the dad, like the kid doesn't comp, the little boy doesn't yeah. comprehend that dad's trying to kill him because you know why would he right? Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, and, but why? And, why and, is the dad but, trying to kill him at the same and, time? And yeah, we have no motivation for the dad. But then also, like, why is the older daughter able to comprehend that? Yeah, I mean, in all seriousness, this is such an unbelievable event. Oh, why yeah. is the daughter able to even? come to grips that quickly with the idea that dad's going to kill them other than the possibility that dad is ar- unless the daughter is already aware of the fact that dad is a yeah. psychopath and and maybe we're getting hints of why she might be aware the way considering dad is obviously having extremely upsetting thoughts about his yeah. daughter yeah the way the, the way cuts. we've seen him we we've seen him look at her the way they've interacted you know up until this point there's not been a lot of dialogue but all the dialogue has been very very curt, you know, five word sentences yeah. at the very most. Um, you know, I think the first the first thing that's said in the movie is he tells the little boy not to eat and talk with his mouth full. That's like yeah. the first audible line in the movie is is the dad telling the little boy to shut up, and that's fifteen minutes in. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's. I don't even know. It's, it's yeah. We it's, get into like they. I will give the director a lot of credit for. You don't know why the dad is doing this, but you yeah. definitely get the feeling that it is within his insane character. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I think this I, is not an unusual. This is not as absurd as it would appear. Yeah. One of the things I get from this movie, and you know, it's it's by no means a deep point, <clears throat> but. But maybe just because I'm a little postmodern in my in my viewpoints of things, anyway. Um, but there's really there's a lot of play on the futility of communication in this movie. Yeah. Um, and that that you can't really you you can't really portray you can't, people can't understand each other in this movie. Um, and maybe uh, we get that from the very start, with with the first words being "shut up" and then everything being so curt and just disjointed in the way they're talking to each other, 
and then the little boy not understanding um, the violent act that his father is trying to, you know. And it's, it's, but at the same time, there's this, there's this sense of, of really at the beginning, we get this weird sense of the powerful destroying the non-powerful. The little girl kills a bunch of ants right before her father starts shooting at her. Mm-mm. So there's, uh, there's, the relationships of power get in there too. There's a lot going on. There's a lot being said. Um, I just, like I said, I just watched this yesterday, and it's. No, oh, I just watched it this afternoon. It's very. We recording it's this. a very heavy. It's a heavy movie. It's a hard it is, movie. Like, did you like it? I'm just uh, just a really I did. go down the brass tacks. I, about I like really that did. Sort of thing. I really did. I did. Yeah, I agree, and that's why I was wondering. It's just you know. It's weird. It is very difficult yeah. to watch. Yeah. Basically upsetting for the entire... F- there is an, a section where it portrays this very idyllic universe in which somehow... I mean, actually, getting into your thing about communication being futile, there's no communication going on, and yet... Like, no legitimate communication going on, and yet that is the best time in the movie. Yeah. Like, for the, the characters involved, is the time when... Oh, absolutely. Nobody understands each other, but everybody knows that nobody understands each other, and they're just yeah. interacting on the absolute most basic level. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, coupled, coupled with that lack of communication, there's a lot of scenes of isolation, too. And obviously, the, yeah. the kids are isolated in, in the desert, and even after, even after they find the Aboriginal, or the Aboriginal finds them on his walkabout, um, there's a lot of... Uh, you know they're isolated, but there's a lot of scenes of just the isolation of the animals, and even at the beginning, when when we're in modern society, um, there's no human interaction really. Um, yeah, yeah. They even show us like the the drill practice for I guess French. Yeah. Where she's just like, <laughs> like yeah. I mean, it, even that is a representation of education without communication. Yeah. Absolutely. There, she's learning French, and yet she is not communicating whatsoever. Yeah. There's no communication going on, despite the fact that theoretically she is learning a language. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, yeah, exactly. they're, they're pretty clear about the fact that communication is. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's it, if it's that communication is pointless and. Well, yeah, we I don't communicate I don't know with it. each other. Or, or if the idea is that we do not communicate. Yeah, I don't think it's as nihilistic as as. Saying that communication is completely pointless, but we still don't communicate, and that's you know that's completely through till the end. The very last scene is right. Her actually, not the only time you actually see legitimate communication, almost from the entire film, is when the little boy is communicating with the Aboriginal. Yeah, eventually through the course of the he, movie, he the boy because I think maybe this is part of the theme of the movie. Who knows? But the little boy is innocent and pure enough that he is capable of communication. Yeah. No, absolutely. On an actual level where they understand yeah. each other and feel each other. Yeah. Like and they do feelings. it through mind. And it's and it's an interesting there's sort of a noble savage ideal in there that, you know, it's a long dead trope it's also in a lot of other yeah. things. Um but but the fact that, you know, the Aboriginal and the prepubescent boy are the only ones who can really understand each other on any basic level and it's only but a basic same- level. At the same time, we see other people. I, I, think, I don't think we have an, a noble savage sort of scenario here, so much as a this he has remained pure a little bit longer. Yeah, than, perhaps. Like the little girl or the 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 girl that the, she is what probably supposed to be sixteen. She's or so supposed. Also, right? I think the character is supposed to be fourteen, but the actress is actually sixteen, uh, which right. is something the director took rather creepy advantage of. Um, yeah, which is weird. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like let's not get into that yet. That's yeah. for the that's for later. Um, but the point is, is that um, he, they are of the same age, but one of them has progressed to the point of incapability of communication faster than the other. Yeah, yeah. And I think that is a little bit of a notion. But you also see later on in the film other Aboriginals who are also incapable of communication. And so it doesn't seem to necessarily paint the Aboriginals as all being pure well, and yeah. capable of community. It's this particular man-child or whatever you want to call him. Yeah. This this fifteen-year-old, sixteen-year-old 
he is capable of communication. But yeah. his, his fellow people are no more ca- capable of communication as we see than anybody else. I mean, they're sitting around cackling and playing in a car while there's a dead man hanging in a tree. Yes. These are not... <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, they're... they're and they, in the juxtaposition, in the juxtaposition that they do sometimes with the city and the Aboriginal people, they're not demonstrating that a better universe in one or the other. They're just showing... It's sort of... It's more of a... The more things change, the more they stay the same sort of... Yeah. Theory, you know. Mm. Yeah, no, I think I think you're definitely, you know, the the lack of communication is cross cultural in this movie. Yeah, exactly. They're saying nobody communicates. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't I didn't mean to suggest when I when I threw out the the noble savage, I didn't mean to suggest that that no, no, this movie in in any way uh, seeks to say that we should all be aboriginals. Um, well, but I think if you I think if you watch the movie without paying attention enough, you could pick up on you could get that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like this movie yeah. could easily be interpreted. If you especially if you take yourself maybe back to the time frame that this film was made when you would still maybe hear people making those kind of arguments. Mm-hmm. I think it could be very easily interpreted that way if you don't think quite deep enough. Yeah, because I mean it's there. It's it's. The, I think the director's trying to say this is this is nonsense, but it there is that element that he he paints. I think almost for just contrast that oh look at this one noble man who is capable of communication. But then you know he goes out of the director goes out of his way to prove that, that he's an abnormality yeah. under any circumstance. Well, and 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 again. Um, you know he's capable of communication, but only with the child. And right, one of right, one exactly. of you know one of the tragedies of the movie is his inability to communicate with the girl. Yes, um, which is oh heartbreaking. Absolutely heartbreaking. Um, and and again, I'm sure something we'll get into a little bit later. Um, the the sexual aspect that all coming of age stories have to have, I suppose. Well, <laughs> but, he is going through puberty, yes. both of them. So yes. So, um, what do we have? Um, this sort there's of nothing else. It's just no, that. there's there's one really great. I I really, you know, because there's always there's there's completely this sense of of you know the mo- nature and society, um, you know, playing off of each other. Like like whenever we see the moon, there's also sounds of satellites passing, like the beep, yeah. beep of Sputnik. Um, it's and, so and the, 1971 in this film. Yeah, yeah, it's very... It's, it's almost... That's one of the few parts of the film that is a little bit... Is about the only part of the film that I find a little bit annoying. Is every so often you get this very, like, 1971 kind of... Oh, look at nature superimposed with uh, man's technology. You get that... I find that that annoying. But, but we get it the other way too. I, that that knife, if if he's truly using it like that, he's cutting both ways. Um, to show, well, yeah, yeah, to, he is. But I find it show, annoying like in said, both directions. <laughs> to show, like you said, this this you know more things change, more things stay the same. Is you know all, all the cultures are the same. They're just hitting different different highs and lows. Like when he kills, um, when he kills the uh, kangaroo. And he's hacking apart the kangaroo, and it's it's juxtaposed with, with a, a butcher, butcher yeah. uh, taking it apart on like a side of beef or something. Um, so you know the cultures are different, but but they're the same in the same way. And you know, uh, and the scene with the Aboriginal group, um, and the scene with say the the weather scientists, you know, is is exactly the same. It's all this sort of. You know, incommunicative sexuality. Um, yeah. Without getting into anything deeper, um, like the the scientists, um, there's there's some workers, there's some scientists, there's one woman among them, and, and yeah, and she's the object of all attention. Yeah. yeah, she's the object of all attention, including the camera does does a lot of male gaze there, um, you know, looking at her legs every time her legs move, looking down her shirt. Um, we don't, but and then I, you know, that's just 
they do a very good job of telling you exactly what those men are thinking about without ever saying yeah. it. So it, yeah. it, you do get into the whole filmmaking thing about show don't tell. Yeah, yeah. No, and, no, and it's, do, it definitely works. Does a I, great I don't want to telling us exactly yeah. what he's what they're thinking without. Yeah, I ever... don't, I don't, I don't mean to fault it. It does go a little over the top. I think at that yeah, point, but... we, we can tell what they're thinking with just the looks they're giving. Not, we don't necessarily That's need true. to follow their gaze. That's true, but I mean, it, 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 I, I think I, I feel that that part is at least no, pretty it's, good it's, filmmaking. It's just because you get, you also get the, but it also really does a good job of portraying them as being kind of pervs you know what i mean like oh, yeah. it's kind of no they're like, clearly they, supposed to be pervs but, but but the weird thing is is then you also get like aboriginal scenes that like if we get we get into the whole the more things change the more things stay the same and they're just as bad kind of thing you know yeah so, yeah it's... absolutely um <laughs> i uh if i can find it we, i've got i've got a sequence here where I just I have the word butt in my notes every other word. <laughs> is it whose butt? Well, as they're traveling together, the girl is is staring at the Aboriginal. At his butt. bus, yeah. So it's camels, butt, yeah. camels butts, uh, imagined explorers butts, carcass butts, desert butts, <laughs> fake tonight. Um, and uh, there's a lot of really interesting cinematic choices, uh, not only with just the jump cuts, but uh, there's one scene I, in particular I remember of him hunting um, just before he gets that that kangaroo um, that we have the butcher with uh, but <laughs> there's I think they do it a couple of times but here's the one that stands in my mind uh, instead of showing him you know actually tracking and hunting it's a bunch of still images of him you know about to throw a spear or or tracking through the bush oh yeah, yeah. Um, they do the same thing when the hunters steal his buffalo yeah exactly Exactly, and it's you know it's, and again it's it's kind of you know the thwarting of power or or the, you know, the yeah power that, that, that that particular but, stylistic choice was odd, and I, it's hard to figure out what he's doing there a little bit in my opinion. Yeah, like, which every I time think he it, does that, it's like it's it does feel like it's. It changes the feel of the film, but I never could quite get a handle on how it changes the feel of the film. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 weird. Um, yeah, exactly. It just feels weird. Yeah, and it, it feels weird because it's it's only done twice or so, and it's it feels really out of place. I guess it's the ultimate jump cut to just show a picture instead of you know, yeah, a single I mean, frame. Maybe that's the whole um, idea for him was like, I'm not even going to show you film. I'm going to show you yeah. a picture. But at the same time, when we get to when we get to the climax of that sequence, in, in both ways, it switches back to video. When he actually when he's actually throwing the spear to kill the kangaroo, we've had a lot of him stalking the kangaroo in pictures. But when he's actually doing the deed, killing it, we switch back to video. Yeah. And it, it happens the same with the hunters. We get a lot of still of him you know, tracking a water buffalo and then getting hit by the car or jumping out of the way of the car or whatever. Um, but then it's video when the hunters are actually mowing down all of the animals. Yeah, and it um, leaves you kind of wondering, like, maybe the whole idea is that this these still images better encapsulate the essence of what's going on than yeah. showing video of them doing these things would. Yeah, yeah. Like, hunting maybe. is just this still image of a hunter. You know what I mean? Like, this is hunting. Yeah. And then, like, the things that happen with the water buffalo, this is poaching, basically. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, this oh, is yeah. What These it are clearly... Is. We're, we've been calling them them. hunters, but they're, they're obviously poachers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's because he's a hunter. They're poachers. Yeah. I mean, we don't know anything about them, so maybe we're slandering them, but basically, they come in and shoot eight buffalo in the matter of yeah. a minute and a half. Obviously, yeah, they are and, not and they hunting leave a, for food. they leave a bunch... Yeah, and then they leave a bunch on the ground, dead, bleeding yeah. out. And so you're left with not many other conclusions other than the fact that this is... And, yeah, I think maybe he jump cuts to say this, to a picture just to say, this is the essence of hunting. This is the essence of poaching. This is the maybe. essence of maybe. whatever. You don't need any yeah. other information. Here's a cave painting of this thing. Which is, yeah. I guess, maybe plays into the theme of like that sort of rock painting is like this is a still image that tells you everything you need to know about what's going on yeah yeah no so. I think there's there's certainly merit to that 
Um, but it's still unsettling for a moviegoer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, there's a lot of unsettling things in this movie, too. Um, Which brings us to 16-year-old girl's breasts. The most unsettling <laughs> thing in this film. Yeah, the, for, like, no reason. Um, except maybe... Maybe to signify that they're not thinking about each other or trying not to think about each other uh, in the same way that the Beast in Beauty and the Beast, whenever he, he's on the brink of being sexually aroused, goes and kills a deer. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we get this scene of uh, you know the 16-year-old girl, well, 14 as far as the story goes. Um, well, that's never explicitly stated. That's yeah, actually don't, we mean. don't know. In, in like, the background in the material, I'm told that Well, because there's a novel and stuff, but yeah, like, yeah, from the movie, all we know is that she is yeah. roughly high school yeah. aged. Yeah, yeah, she's she's a teenager. And the only um, reason we know he's 16 is because we read the Wikipedia yeah. page that tells you it's 16 well, is when no. they do a walkabout. No, that was, it was at the beginning of the movie. That oh, okay, yeah, that's true, I forgot about that. They do the walkabout. Um, uh, but, so we get him off hunting, um, after they both kind of uh, accept that, uh, you know, there's a... Uh, it's really gratuitous. It really is. Um, well, yeah. I mean, it. What makes it gratuitous is not. They could have done everything they did without sixteen-year-old girl breasts. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's the not entire even, I mean, concept uh, could we, have been accomplished without it. This girl. This girl. Which was just makes the director a bit of a perv. Yeah, completely nude in this scene. Um, yeah, I it's mean, not it's, even, it's, it's not just 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 her breasts. It, you know, we see we see her whole body, um, but it, it plays right after like they're. They've had this moment earlier, um, just before this, um, where he really seems to see... And she's been staring at his butt for, for days now. Um, but we get this moment where uh, he kind of first sees her sexually while they're, while they're climbing the tree, and he looks at her butt, too. Um, <laughs> there's lots of butts. Um, yes. Which is why your notes are nothing but butts. Yeah. Uh, so they, you know, they hang together in the tree. Um, this is juxtaposed with the aboriginals discovering the car and the dead bloated body also hanging in the tree. Uh, and obviously... It's so weird juxtap- to, uh, juxtaposition and really yeah, and a uh, little bit uncomfortable in itself. Oh, uncomfortable, but at the same time, a foreshadowing of, of a later scene. Right, um, yeah. Once you've seen the whole movie. Yeah. There's a lot of scenes, there's a lot of cuts right there of sort of, you know, she's 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 got some... Uh, I don't know if it's suggested that she's menstruating or if she's just got a rash from climbing the tree. Um, but there's a lot of scenes, uh, clips right there. She's she's kind of rubbing her thigh, uh, and he looks concerned. Um, and she says, no, it's fine, I'll be fine in the morning. But then we get a lot of sh- just tree limbs that are very clearly supposed to be um, fair-skinned crotches uh, with red marks in the middle of them. Um, <laughs> oh, director. Yeah, and then we cut to, you know, um, he's kind of, they're very close, and, you know, in any, in any Western movie where both characters were, were, were Western grown, this would be the scene where they're kind of about to kiss and then don't, um, but instead they're a little further away from kissing in this, um, uh, and, you know, the communication breaks down again, um. He, he clearly wants to do something and doesn't understand how to convey that. Um, but, right, uh, it's, when it, but it's all climaxing towards the final, ultimate yeah, it's, communication it's, breakdown, which happens yeah. in that last scene with him, yeah, it's, which is it, just heartrending. It's just the worst. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's climaxing in that, but at the same time, then we segue directly into him off on the hunt the next day with the little boy and them, you know, being communicating a little better and getting yeah, they better do communicate, uh, as they develop yeah. their whole mind thing and her skinny dipping uh, for no reason. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and we jump back really, and forth. That, that's, the, that's the worst part in my mind is yeah. that just for no reason. It's completely gratuitous. It um, is and that's what makes it upsetting is that there's it's kind of like what? Why? I mean yeah. well and then especially you could show skinny dipping without showing anything if you really wanted yeah, to. It wouldn't yeah. even be hard at I mean, all, but they don't. I don't. 
don't know why. We get a little more messing with the narrative there because obviously uh, he's hunting, he's cooking. This is taking hours, and she's swimming the entire time. <laughs> right, I right. Don't, I don't know if it's really... It's, it's, if we believe the way it's presented to us, she's swimming for like 12 hours. Um, yeah, you never know. For, yeah. Um, so it's just weird. A lot of weird messing with the narrative. There is a, there is a scene here, uh, right around that moment, uh, where the Aboriginal runs across a, uh, a random Caucasian woman. Um, and again... Uh, cementing the whole idea of isolation, um, they, she and he can't talk, so she goes on and goes down to this ranch that is on one side of a ridge as he goes down the other side of the ridge to where the other kids are. Well, and the weirdest thing um, is, is at least in my version, she, apparently in different versions, the scene plays out a little bit different is what I was reading. Yeah. Uh, Not, I, yeah. And all the scenes you don't get in all the versions, you don't get the exact same thing. But in my version, she sees the two obviously Caucasian children. Okay. And doesn't do anything about it. Yeah. Um, the way it's cut in the, in the criterion edition that I had, uh, which is apparently supposed to be the director's final cut. Um, she doesn't necessarily see them. We see her passing them, but it's believable that she does not look at them. Okay, because in... Uh, and therefore we, did you, see them. I See, I thought in my version I saw her look in their direction okay. and see them. So maybe we watch maybe, different maybe. versions, but... Like, all I, in my mind, I don't see why that would be changed, because in my mind that's even a further of that man's distance from his fellow man kind of yeah. theme. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, she, she sees it and does nothing about it because she's too yeah. wrapped up in her own yeah. world of going to the ranch and meeting with her her lover or whatever, who is her a... lover. A, who is an asshole. Yes. Pardon my yes. French. Yes, he goes, he goes down to the... She goes down to the ranch here, and this guy uh, has a whole bunch of... Um, Borderline you know, slaves. I, I, yeah. Um, it's, it's a whole bunch of aboriginals. I... Uh, in the sort of uh, the dress of uh, like the Catholic school, um, you know, boarding Aboriginals, like because Australia did the same thing to their natives as we did to ours here in America, um, and and you know, rounding up the kids and putting them into into schools to westernize them, to modernize them, blah blah blah. So it's a bunch of a bunch of kids. Um, Dressed as opposed to any of the other Aboriginals we've seen in Western sorts of clothing, though very cheaply made, um, and they're all making uh, <laughs> statues. Statues, Australian, uh, Australian esque you know, statues. Very inauthentic looking things. Yeah, well, I mean, it's very. It's they're for tourists. I mean, they're right. very obviously just plaster. Well, exactly, and that for, gets into. I mean, which is even more. Along the point of the yeah. director with that is just they're making these yeah, crappy it's, it's, plaster mold things that don't even really look like yeah. Australian things. Yeah, it's 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 more communication breakdown. It's exactly non representative. You know, can't say can't say truth sorts of things. Um, but he does he does he's not quite a slave driver because he gives them a break. He announces a break. When he follows the woman into the house, right? Exactly. Um, Their only break she's time is when he's going to go. Yeah. Get a little bit Presumably. of afternoon delight. Yeah, uh, which is really I, I found that that scene kind of weird because while she is sitting on the bed, um, any other time where something like that happens in the movie uh, would be so much more centralized. Yeah. Centralized. This, and she's not really at all. She's I know just one, sitting I wonder on if that's on purpose, if this is like supposed to represent yeah. some sort of nearly mechanical behavior. Yeah, and maybe it is. Maybe it is. Because um, she had a very mechanical vibe to her the entire time you see her. Yeah. The way she walks, yeah, the way she moves, everything is so... I do this because I robotic. do this every day. Yeah. Yeah. No, no you're absolutely right there. Um, and maybe that's, maybe that's what it is. Um, that... They just exist in their roles. I guess. Well, yeah, exactly. And you, it, it, you again, you get into this like communication breakdown and not actually interacting with your fellow man thing with that, yeah. in that they're both acting out these roles. That this, this very sensual, very uh, intimate behavior has turned into some sort of robotic action for them. 
Yeah. So. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, um, we get our one... Right around here, I'm kind of going through this chronologically, I guess. Sorry, I, I don't... I wrote, all of chronology my, doesn't all mean of anything my, to me. Yeah. Well, it doesn't mean a whole lot to the movie <laughs> Anybody either. can watch this film. Um, yeah, but my notes are all kind of stream conscious uh, reaction to what I'm... What, what I saw, so I'm gonna just cycling through those. Um, we get the one, the one cross narrative, um, because why does why does that scene with with the scientists exist at all, uh, except that they lose a weather balloon, and at this point, uh, the other group they find the weather balloon, yeah, um, and they send it back up into the air um, after looking at it, and then they find an abandoned farmhouse. And the girl welcomes it because it is, despite being abandoned, it is still modern comforts to an extent, or at least comforts that she recognizes as yeah. comforts. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so she kind of lives in there, and, and they use that as base. Um, the, uh, the boy and the Aboriginal find a paved road. Uh, and he's very excited. He realizes that this means that they can go home. And he's not sad about that. He's very excited. But at the same time, he doesn't tell her directly. Um, so, you know, there's there's a sense of trepidation, but that's never really played out. Because um, he very excitedly shows the boy. And he obviously knows what this means because he's excited about it. It's not... It doesn't seem like he's excited just because it's a paved road. Right, right. It's it's not like this is the first time he's seen a paved road and he wants to know what it is. He's, yeah, he yeah, knows exactly. What it is. And then both of them, both the boy and the the Aborigine, fail to yeah tell her. Yeah, no one no one tells her until until later. Um, Basically, after yeah. it's too late for it to mean anything. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Um, so, uh, um, but he, he leaves the road, um, and he finally, we have that whole scene with the poachers and the, and the water buffalo, and he's, which is weird, we cut to this sort of boneyard, um, and, and more, more aboriginal music in the background of a, this boneyard of a bunch of water buffalo bleached skulls, and we have our Aboriginal boy lying among them in this ceremonial paint makeup, you know, that that we can assume, we can assume what this means. We're never told explicitly, and that's another, you said this earlier, one thing this movie does very well is, is showing and not telling. Yeah. Because it is very, very well conveyed, you know, imagery-wise and, and through action, what is going on without it being explicitly stated. And, you know, there's there's the silence and the isolation of that and, and the lack of communication in that, but at the same time, communication still finds a way. Uh, but th- between our characters, it doesn't always. So yeah. he's in his ceremonial thing, and he goes back and he discovers, he discovers the girl while she's dressing, um, and he starts doing this dance for her, and she dances and dances, staring intently at her, wearing nothing but feathers and paint. Um, and it's, it's very clearly this courtship thing, but she's just scared. She doesn't understand what's going on, she can't communicate with him. Um, yeah, and it's really difficult in that scene to decide which character to sympathize for. I mean, yeah. like, it's really, I mean, you end, for me personally, you end up sympathizing with the, the Aboriginal uh, man, but yeah. both of them are clearly not able to grasp the other. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because Absolutely. in the end, we do get to the point that throughout the entire prior elements of the movie, we do see that she does find him attractive. Yeah. She yeah, is attracted absolutely. to him. And he he does reciprocate that, but they are incapable of communicating to each other, because from her yeah. point of view, this dance is just terrifying, and from his point of view, yeah. why doesn't she get my dance? <laughs> yeah, exactly. but it's really exactly. it's so depressing because it's not it's not depressing because she doesn't get it, and it's not depressing because he doesn't get it. It's depressing because of the net result of it. Yes, he dances for like twelve hours, 
and can barely lift himself by the end of it. Um, and then uh, the girl has fallen asleep, and the little boy wakes him up. Um, he's the the Aboriginal. We we've, we've seen him. He's he's collapsing. He's crying. Um, he's he's the complete futility of what he's trying to do is is bearing on him, wearing on him, and wearing him down. Uh, so the little boy wakes up, wakes up our our, our girl, um, and tells him, tells her that the Aboriginal is he's not there. He's gone. Um, and they bathe, and they get dressed in their school clothes because, you know, they're on their way to the road, they're going to go, since he's left them, uh, and then they find him hung in a tree. Which, how in, he in got a in a tree is yeah, baffling it's, he's in like, itself. He's, he's wedged, you know, it's, it's... He hasn't hung himself in, you know, noose around the neck sort of way. But he's wedged himself. It's very clear that that he had to have done this. I mean, there's no one else around, so he had right, to. Right, it is him himself. doing it to himself. But um, it, was he trying to kill himself, or did he just die because I, he couldn't finish the action of getting up the tree? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if he. Yeah, but he's wedged himself between a Y-shaped branch, and he's got his arms out. It's a very it's it's a crucifix pro. A yeah, pose. it is. And so you're um, left with the idea that he killed himself a little bit. Yeah, and you're left with the idea that he killed himself. Um, which I guess is, is one place where, where that's not necessarily clear. That is the, probably the, the most unclear part of the film, film, for me at least, was... Yeah. Yeah. That. Um, you know, he's, he's hung in a tree, uh, the little boy still not understanding the concept of death, apparently, uh, even from the father and, you know, bookends. Um, and however many animals knife, he's seen killed in yes, the past. Offers him a pen knife which obviously he doesn't take because he's dead. Um, so she wipes ants off of him, and then they go. And they're on their way back to society. There's gravel, there's electric poles, there's a truck. Well, and I just uh, to go back to the ant wiping thing, I before we move on to them getting back to society real quick, um, it's yeah. really interesting because I read some stuff about the film, and they refer to that scene as like a very touching thing that she does where she kind of wipes the ants from him but at the same time like for me it didn't come off as I mean it's nice that she was even concerned about him at that point but at the same time she also just leaves his body in a tree and I find that disregard gave me the, a different impression is that like oh well he's dead now I'm just going to return to a civilization yeah, it yeah. gives her you know, such a blasé sort of attitude that I. Yeah. After that point, I no longer care for the character. Well, it's you know she's she's she in this she's through the whole movie she's on this right in brink of being a child and being an adult, and it is kind of the last childlike thing she does. Yeah. Is is just to. That's true. Just wipe it off. And, and wipe herself off and and yeah it's just a weird scene the memory because away. they do talk about it in like re- like commentary on this film about like oh it's her you know she does she shows affection yeah, for him with I this I don't think it's, it's like, necessarily I don't know I don't about think that. that specifically I don't think that specifically is necessarily a sign of affection yeah it's, I, I, I read right several there. things that said that and I was like yeah I don't know about that yeah. guys I mean obviously Obviously, you know, in the very last scene, we see that she was affectionate, we, and and still is, uh, presumably as an adult, even though it's the same actress. So, um, yeah, it's it's even weirder yeah. then. Yeah, yeah, but you know, they she's she's seen, and there's there's her husband or boyfriend or whatever um, is telling her about work, and she's not listening, and he's not communicating. And instead, she's daydreaming about her and her brother and the Aboriginal all skinny dipping. And this was, you know, the heaven of her life was this time lost in the desert. Um, it's what she keeps thinking about. So obviously, you know, she, she's reminiscent and she's very affectionate about that. But in this scene in particular, her wiping the axe off, I don't know if that's necessarily a sign of 
the affection. Yeah. It might be a sign of her coming to terms with everything that's happened in the last couple of hours. Maybe, yeah. And it, but it's weird also because she does look back at this this time as this great moment she daydreams about it. But I guess that is her as an adult and before she is a child and she doesn't she is not an adult when she leaves him yet. Yeah. Which is weird because you would kind of expect that to be the moment in the film where the, her coming of age moment where she becomes an adult. Yeah. And instead yeah. she does something that's yeah. really weird, which is just leave. Like, okay, we're gonna go. Yeah, we she, just found the guy we spent a month with react. in the des dead in a tree. She doesn't know how to react. She doesn't know how to react. Um because she's still a child is yeah. really what I get from Which that. is weird because that's um, the moment I would have expected her to not be yeah, a child exactly. anymore. And I guess maybe no. the doc- the director is playing with our preconceptions or just did it in a weird way that we don't like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Either's possible. Um, they follow the road to an abandoned town and there's a really great, somewhat funny scene, I suppose. Um, not that there's not bits of humor throughout the movie. Um, but uh but the first the first you know white guy who speaks english man who speaks english period first person they've met in who knows how long because who knows what this <laughs> the timeline of this film narrative right. is um but uh you know the first person they've seen since their father um says about as much as their father said to them <laughs> in that last day uh they knock on the door and they're begging for help and uh, all he says essentially is uh, this is private property don't touch anything yeah don't touch that water don't don't touch that bucket yeah yeah so you know we have we have that last juxtaposition of this you know very inviting native who gave his all for them um, even though his death wasn't exactly sacrificial uh, the crucifix suggests that it's meant to be. Um, and then at the same time, um, I, mean, I guess it is kind of sacrificial because it doesn't, it, it eliminates any reason they have to not go down the road. Yeah. Um, uh, and then they go back to civilization and it's an incredibly inhospitable Australian fellow. Yeah. Um, Just a total jerk. Yeah. You know, what do we do now? And then they just kind of mess around in an abandoned, think, which is also kind of a weird facility. scene. It is yeah. kind of a gratuitous scene. It, it, but I guess it's not because it shows that they oh. are doing the same things that they did out in the wilderness. Now they're just doing it yeah. in civilization. Yeah, it's one last scene of of play too. Um, and you know, throughout the movie, throughout the movie, they become a little more. Aboriginal. I mean, obviously, we get a scene of a little boy in like full paint, um, but at the same time, she slowly lost some of the trappings of her of her societyness. Uh, she does eventually completely lose her stockings, and even when they dress back in their school clothes, she doesn't have them. Um, whereas in the first half of the movie, she's very intent on having them on at all times, um, not explicitly, but she's still. She's always wearing them. And I would think if I were in the middle of the desert, stockings might be the first thing I'd take Yeah, off. exactly. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't get it told to us again, but you can tell that, yeah. she, well, and she, you see her trying to rinse she's, things off and stuff. Yeah. That just is kind of a waste yeah, of time. She's trying, to, she's trying to hold on to society, even as she's trapped in this. Yeah. And, and maybe that, that last scene with the ants is her still trying to hold on to her childhood, even as she's being thrust into something greater too or something bigger at least something different not necessarily greater yeah when um, you consider what happens for the rest of her life apparently yeah. as portrayed in that yeah. last scene but I find, not greater yeah, the ending the ending of that though the ending of that you know we get them they go to this junkyard and he plays and she she plays with him and then we just stop that yeah it's and then weird. she's an adult we've got a car going to the same apartment that they lived in um, that that her parents had lived in apparently at least the same apartment building and with the establishing shot um, and she's doing the same thing that her mother did at the beginning when we come in putting together a meal 
then this guy talks to her and she doesn't communicate with him and she remembers oh the idyllic youth and it's a weird ending that I'm not sure I found as satisfying as I would like to have found because yeah it, the scenes of them playing are very saddening right like I mean that that, that those yeah. mem that ideal time that memory of that ideal time is very is very sad but at the same time we also see that like all of this progression for this girl all these experiences amounted to nothing <laughs> she yeah. ended up exactly like her mother well no, yeah nothing nothing on the surface right I mean I she's mean, having internal everything. dreams that probably her mother didn't have but yeah. that doesn't mean anything she's still married to a guy who comes home and talks about the pro like yeah. whatever Bob yeah. quit and the, I'm gonna be can't. the problem she doesn't care about yeah and so like yeah she's different inside maybe than her mother was but it had no practical yeah. effect apparently on her life well, yeah, and absolutely no practical effect, and that's why we finish with that A.E. Hausman poem, Into My Heart, in Air That Kills, From Yon Far Country Blows, What Are Those Blue Remembered Hills, What Spires That Farms, uh, What Farms Are Those, That Is the Land of Lost content, Content, or Content, rather, I See It Shining Plain, The Happy Highways Where I Went and Cannot Come Again. It's Memory is is a lost land. Yeah, and I understand that. We can't get and to. you could have you would still get the same basic concept regardless of how we see her life turn out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like no. she could be sitting no, in an office true. as the manager of the office and having the yeah. same daydream instead of just as a housewife. Right, exactly. What I'm saying uh -huh. is is that not that I have any problem with the idea that memory is <laughs> is it is it is an alien land, is a country you can never return to. That I'm fine with as a concept, and it very, fits into the narrative of the story. My only problem is that clearly this experience should have altered her, and it didn't yeah. appear to do anything. And it doesn't seem to have. Yeah. And, and it's not even yeah. from my satisfaction as a viewer that it should have altered her, but that kind of experience yeah. would legitimately alter the personality of any person who went yeah. through it. She made it back to society, and she just rejoined society as if she Right, never like, they could have shown her in yeah. any other scenario beyond what her mother was, and it would have been yeah. an acceptable net result. But what we do end up seeing is that, oh, this was like a vacation from the universe for her that yeah. had no result. And, and I don't believe that. I find that see, unbelievable. I don't, think, I don't think I would be as... Um, nonplussed about that if it weren't for the fact that the mother was such a non-character she doesn't she she smokes a cigarette and she cuts a bunch of food that's all yeah, we know about I know but I mean is she's but they show the, her doing the exact just, same yeah. thing as her mother yeah and then and then her her doing the exact same thing if her mother had been more um, of this developed thing and and we don't need that in this movie but one of the reasons it's disconcerting at the end is that she's become this meaningless character, character that we know. Yeah, this meaningless character. Yeah, it's... And then she's just got this memory. Um, yeah. So, it's, it's like we said, like we continually said, it's a very hard movie to watch. Yeah, but a great uh, movie also. Because, so. what a great movie at the same time. Uh, it ends, and I don't know if this is supposed to be some sort of art house, like ending the movie with Finn, or 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 if this is purposeful to this movie itself. But the very last title card says "Rien na uh, va plus." Uh, it's French. I don't know if I'm saying it right, uh, but it's it's a roulette term. Actually, it means no further bets. Yes, is the last thing we see. Interesting. I didn't notice that. I think I turned the movie off as soon as yeah. I got to the credits. Yeah, but it, it fades to black for like a few seconds before that pops up. So I can understand if you thought the movie was already over. Uh, which is why I don't know if this is necessarily part of the movie. Um, but it's it's very... It's what you say, you know, in roulette when, you know, there's no more speculation. You can't, you can't, you know, obviously you can't lay down any more bets. But you're you're cemented in your decisions already. 
is is how that plays That's in interesting. the play. <laughs> as a as a so, footnote to the film. So as a footnote to the movie, it's it's very it's a very interesting thing to say. Um, you know, I don't know. There's a lot to think about there, and the fact. It's, this, it's the sort of thing I should have put more thought into than than twelve hours after I watched the movie talking about it. Um, but but yeah, we talked we talked last time about hard boiled and how I overthought hard boiled. But but there's I don't think there's a lot of overthinking this no. movie because this movie is just so heavy in what it's trying to I say. I would not be surprised. And not heavy handed in what it's it, trying to say. Just with only an hour, I'm sure we missed bits that the director, if he were listening yeah. to it, would be like, "Oh, you missed my." My masterpiece. You yes, missed the most important yes. part of the film. Didn't you notice that well, bird in frame thirty-eight? <laughs> yes, that that bird, that bird at, at the thirty-eight minute mark. Uh, the way he looked up at the moon and then drank all of the water. That's the whole film. <laughs> it's the whole movie. The whole movie. <laughs> anyway, yeah, uh, before we get too rambly. Perhaps we yeah, should end. Yeah, we've 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 hit our mark. Yeah, thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you. This was a good one. Yeah, this is actually I I absolutely recommend this movie. There's a few that I wouldn't recommend necessarily, but this this is definitely up there for for one. Not not quite as not quite as uh, an exciting a recommendation as 400 blows, but no, it's not as good as 400 still, blows. Is, I we yeah. have yet to find one well, that great, I like that much, yeah. but we'll see. We yeah. have a long way to go. But this is still a great movie to watch. Uh, thanks for listening. Next time we'll be talking about the Seventh Seal, um, classic of art house. Well, really got the American art house movement started uh, as we imported that Swedish film, Ingrid Bergman's. 1957 classic. Yep. The 7th See you then, I guess. So, we'll see you then. Thank you.